<laughs> uh oh. <laughs> We're having a great debate, sitcoms, Office versus Friends. I've never watched The Office, so I don't have any way to describe this. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> there's a homework question off of Worksheet 22, which is a fantastic assignment. And that's why it's funny every single time. Uh, number 18, number 18, oh, you mean that six-part question? Yes. Do I have to do all of them? Yes. No. I didn't do any of them, so I didn't know. Okay, well, I'll do, let's see, the hardest one is... about A, D, and E? Well, A's not hard at all. You're just panicking for no reason. Let's check out D. That's probably the hardest one. So it says, sign arc cosine of 2x. So this is that algebraic one. So first thing you have to remember is 2x is really 2x over 1. And when it's an algebraic inverse question, we just assume that our triangle is always in the first quadrant because we're going to have positive variables. So this first clue, this inside clue here, says that the cosine of this mysterious value is the ratio 2x over 1. So you could label sides of your triangle based on that information. So your adjacent leg could be a 2x, and your hypotenuse could be a 1. And you could set up full-out Pythagorean theorem, but I know everyone's looking for a shortcut these days. So what is the shortcut for finding a leg in Pythagorean theorem? You take the square root of the hypotenuse squared, and you subtract the leg squared. Now, if that was a mystery to you, you would just set up 2x squared plus call the other one whatever you want, y squared equals 1 squared, and then you do Pythagorean theorem and solve for y. So, anywho, um, the hypotenuse is a 1, so that's boring. And this is the only part I'm worried about. If you were to take this leg and square it, what would that be? 4x squared. There we go. Okay. So, you have all the parts of the triangle filled out? Yes. This is part D. Uh, I'm on question D. There's a lot of questions on this one. I, I, if I had to take a guess, I think Daniel ran out of steam in doing his homework, and he's like, I don't want to do number 18. That was our whole lesson yesterday, Daniel. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Okay, sign. Sign ratio is what over what? Little kid formula works. That's a big kid formula, but thank you. So opposite over hypotenuse, so we would set up opposite. And then if you could say over 1, but most humans don't, so you could just say that's your answer. So the idea is they're giving you a clue about one of the ratios in your triangle. Go set up your triangle in the first quadrant. You'll have to do some funky algebra Pythagorean theorem to find the missing leg, or sometimes the hypotenuse, sometimes nothing. And then based on that triangle, you can set up any ratio they ask for the outside of the composition function. You feel like you can move forward on those, Daniel? They're all kind of the same. That's the hardest one. So, like, with A, right. So, you set me up a triangle in the first quadrant where your tangent ratio is x over 1. So, vertical leg is x and adjacent leg is 1. You don't even have to do Pythagorean theorem on that one because the thing they ask for is cotangent, which doesn't even have the hypotenuse in it. Yeah, reciprocal. One over x. Yeah. That one was a nice easy one, as is b. But then after that, you do have to set up the triangles. Well, that's just because you're a thorough kid. Good job. So did I. On, on these questions, yes, they just do each other because they're all in the first quadrant. Okay. But on the other questions, we got to be careful because of they're only being defined in certain quadrants. We can't just magically cancel them out every time. I think drawing triangles is the way to go. Who doesn't love a nice triangle in the quadrant plane? I don't. Yeah. Wait, aren't you going to like build spaceships or something? <laughs> I feel like you should like triangles. I feel like that's a requirement. Okay, 
Um, so first of all, apologies. Uh, my answer key for the last 24 hours has had the wrong sketch of this. So should we do this one? Mm-hmm. Apparently it tricked me. Okay, so this is a second time of us testing advanced factoring. We're on the review right now. And the review is going into your homework check. So make sure you do it. All right. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a, a lot in our homework check this time, so we thought, eh, you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm going to be the lazy kid this time who calls the midline the midline. Because I'm going to label it. It's going to be good. All right. So, midline is a 1. What is your amplitude? Oh, I tricked you. Just 3. Amplitude is the absolute value of this number. The negative is the reflection. So your max line, if you move 3 units up, you're at a 4. If you move 3 minute units down, you're at a negative 2. This is a major problem I saw. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, what's the period? Normally it's 2 pi for cosine. However, this guy has a B value of 2. So the period is actually pi. And this is where I made my mistake. I never calculated my quarter point. <laughs> so I got to figure out what I'm going to be counting by. So you're supposed to, for cosine and sine, you're supposed to take the period and divide it by 4. So pi over 4. I'm going to throw a K after that, just so, because there's a lot of information I'm about to write down. I get really confused because half of them have pi's in them, and it's confusing. All right, let's talk about the phase shift, guys. There is definitely a phase shift in this problem. This was an issue for some of us on the last test. Which direction is this phase shift? Yes, this is a left pi over 2. So I'm just going to kind of arbitrarily mark... A, a point over here as my starting point. I'm going to call it negative pi over 2. And then as I make my marks, I'm supposed to be adding pi over 4 each time. So you have to either decide whether you want to do fifth grade mental fractions or whether you want to do some work on your calculator. So if it's on your calculator, if you're trying to go from negative pi over 2 and you're, you're trying to add a pi over 4 to that, you would just type the coefficients of negative 1 half plus 1 fourth math enter enter and you're going to find out that it's negative one-fourth. So the next time that you make a mark, it's going to be at negative pi over four. So if I add another pi over four to that, the next time I make a mark would be at zero. And then it would be at one pi over four. And then I need one more. Two pi over four, better known as pi over two. Now before I like go through and make my drawing, I just make sure that I got a full cycle as a distance of pi, which is the original period that they had up here which it is so something i want to bring up to you we just happen to cross through the axes as one of our critical marking points here it doesn't always hit at zero and my memory from last year was the test and it's a little different this year but i think the same issue occurs so maybe your graph starts at like negative pi over four but the next time you make a point it's not going to be at zero. It's going to be like somewhere after zero because of how you're counting. I had a lot of kids do this. And then they were like off. Like the whole graph. Because they were like insistent that they should make a point on the axes. Now it crosses the axes, but not at your max, min, or middle lines. Okay. In this case, yes. But the one on the test, I don't think it does. I just want to bring that to your attention. Like, you don't always have to have a marking on the axes. It, it depends on what you're counting by. So watch out for that on your test tomorrow. Um, you should be shouting something at me because you know I'm going to forget. Uh-huh. Cosine graph, but it's been reflected. So while I would usually start at the maximum, never mind. This time I'm starting at the minimum. So cosine graph. And then, of course, I ruin it by graphing it. Uh, that wasn't too bad. I was actually pretty proud of that one. Um, you guys did a really nice job with writing your ordered pairs off to the side last test. So as long as you're graphing right, your ordered pairs were right. Sometimes I get kids who write them backwards. That's silly. You didn't do that, though. Although maybe you will because you haven't taken your test yet. I don't know what you're going to do. Who knows? <laughs> All right. This one. Now. There's a bunch of labeled points here, guys. Could you please like pay attention to them? 
for instance, this line up here had a lot of kids who think it says negative five because there's like a dash in front of five. It's five. And then this line here, look at the ordered pairs. It's negative one. And you don't have to calculate anything, guys. It says what this is. It's two. So just by that, I've already figured out a few of these answers. Let's start with amplitude. It's three. Regardless of whether you think there's a reflection, that doesn't change the amplitude size. Now, the period length is a little difficult. You have to decide like where you think it starts and stops, and that's open to interpretation, but it should be the same answer regardless of how you interpret this. I'm going to pretend like my graph starts here for like everything. And then this is the one cycle that it's going to go through, and it's going to stop right here. So i got to figure out how long that distance is from pi over 3 to 5 pi over 6. So that's simply a subtraction problem. You just have to subtract in either order, and you can just ignore the negative if you go backwards. But 5, 6 minus 1 third, um, which you could think of as 2 pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. So this comes out to 3 pi over 6, better known, better known as pi over 2, pi over 2. Which is great, but that's not part of my formula. B is what I need to calculate now. So some of us forgot how to calculate B. It's 2 pi divided by the period. So if you took 2 pi and you divided by pi over 2, that would be multiplying by the reciprocal. The pi's would cancel, and you get 2 times 2, which is 4. <clears throat> right? Now, this is where I need you to not be too creative. Decide where you want to start your graph. And I will have multiple answers on my answer key. And even then, if you still get more creative than that, I'll, I'll figure it out. But this is not a good moment in Mrs. Abruzzo's life to make her think really hard when I'm grading tests, okay? So where would be a logical place do you think this guy starts? I'm thinking that's a great place to say your function starts. Because this one's not labeled, so I'm a little weary of that one. And this one, I just don't like the number. So I'm going to start it here. Now, because I'm choosing to start my function here, what kind of function am I going to be plugging in? This is a sine graph who has something extra going on here. It's got a reflection. i got to remember that. In fact, maybe I'll just go ahead and throw a negative 3 right in front. Okay, so if that's our starting point, that means our phase shift is right pi over 3. If you said, no, 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 I think it's right 11 pi over 24, and I'm going to call it cosine, cool. I'll have that ready on the answer key as well. Uh, vertical shift. That's the midline. It's the same question. So vertical shift of up to, which means your midline is at y equals 2. Literally, these are the same questions, so make sure they match. All right, we're ready to do this. If we decide all agree to start right here, we have a reflected sign with an amplitude of 3. Your B value shows up next in your formula. Keep it factored out of your phase shift. We all agreed that the phase shift could be a right pi over 3. What does that look like? Negative. Yes. <laughs> Theta or x minus pi over 3. And then a midline of up to. Oh, I didn't close my other parentheses. Good call. So that's just one possibility for a formula that would match up with that, that graph. I've had kids who pull it back to here and they try to figure out what that point is, which I think is really interesting. I don't know why you would do that. <laughs> it's very curious. All right. Uh, sinusoidal regression is still on the test, the calculator stuff where you got to do sine reg, make sure you're in radian mode. Pretty much this whole test is radian mode unless you're doing creative testing things at the end of the test. Like, I can't remember what tangent of 60 degrees is. Then you might want to change your mode and type some stuff kind of thing. I don't know why you would do that because you have a unit circle, but whatever. <clears throat> that. Suit so yourself. That's right. Do you, I have a couple of examples of modeling questions. I would say this was pretty weak on the last test. You want me to go through both of them? Okay. So unfortunately, the key to these questions are the sketches, which is not my strong suit. So help me out here. We have an alien body temperature <laughs> that varies sinusoidally. Uh, nine minutes after they start timing, it's at a high temperature of 130. And then 40 minutes after that point, it reaches a low temperature of 108. So they just, that's the whole problem. They've given me everything I need to get through this question. So let's start with a sketch. We've got high temperature of 130. You catch that? 
You got a low temperature of 108. I didn't realize aliens ran so much warmer than humans. I thought they'd be colder. <laughs> or maybe we just made up this problem. Okay. I know. All right, so here's the key. You have to just accept that there's going to be a phase shift. It makes your math easier. Nine minutes after you start timing is when it reaches the high point. So I'm just going to say, you know what, guys? We, we got a high point right here, nine minutes into the clock. And then it reaches a low point. If you want to put a time down, you can. It's 40 minutes after that. So it'd be 49, yeah. Um, but what I really am interested in is the period. That's what we're trying to get at. So I always, even though my graph didn't complete the cycle with their information, I just kind of extend it out and I complete the cycle because here's what I need from you. What is the length of the period from here to here? 40 minutes. Well, it's 40 and then another 40, so it's 80 minutes. And that was a mistake I saw from a few people on the last test. They only took half the period and then they're like, boom, there's the period, but that wasn't the whole thing. Now notice I didn't finish labeling things down here. It doesn't matter. All I need this axis for is period because the period is what helps me calculate B. B is 2 pi over period, so I need a pi over 40. That's going to be part of my formula. Hang on to that. The other parts of the formula that I need, obviously it's cosine. That's not a mystery to me anymore. I need to know midline and I need to know amplitude size. So a little calculation for the midline, which you know I screw up half the time, so I'm pretty sure this is the atom and divide by 2 thing. But then I'm going to verify it by looking at the amplitude. I heard it's 119, which means I would be 11 up and 11 down. So I should see some symmetry, which I do, which means my amplitude is 11. All right, here we go. I'm ready to write my equation. The body temperature of this little alien. Let's see here. Amplitude is 11. Clearly, we're looking at a cosine graph who has a B value of pi over 40. Has a phase shift though, because we just accepted that we were going to start nine minutes in. So what does that look like in my formula? We'll use x. x minus nine, good. Close your cosine function, and then your midline is 119. Now, notice lots of parentheses going on there because it's in factored form. And there's a follow-up question this time on the test, guys. Predict the body temperature at 55 seconds. So I need you to type this, and it can be in your home screen. I need you to type in 55 seconds in place of X. I need you to watch how you're typing it. Watch your parentheses. Everyone practice typing this, please. I think, I think, you get 109.2 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> now, this is where kids have to make good test decisions. They're like, you know what? I'm not sure if I did this one right. Like, I'm very nervous about this question. So then they go to their calculators graphing and they try to model it. Um, that's fine. I might wait to do that until after I finish the rest of the test, though. Like, give it your best shot. Finish the test. Look up at the clock. Go, woohoo, I have 10 minutes left. And then go back to the alien problem and say, if I type this into y equals, you have certain data points that you know are true. Like, for instance, when x equals 9, your graph should be at 130. When x equals 49, you know your graph should be at 108. And if you type it in and you test those points and you don't see that, then you know you did something wrong. Unfortunately, that's not a really good moment to have at the end of your test. But Don't do that in the middle of your test. I think that's what happened to some people last test. That's why we ran out of time. So we were like panicking. <laughs> we are trying to figure it out. Yes, Daniel. You mean like when you check it on the calculator? I mean, I guess there's always a way for you to botch it up. Like if you had like double the period for some reason or half the period. It would be difficult to mess it up that bad. Yeah, I got you. All right. So the next question is about the dead fish stuck to the paddle wheel. You want to do that one too? That's a good question, isn't it? Okay, so this is the question where, because paddle wheels and boats, they go underneath the water level, so you should have a negative minimum, so don't panic. <laughs> All right, oh, dead fish. Um, 
My stopwatch reads four seconds. The fish was at its highest point. So this is very much like our alien question, right? Where it's going to start at the top, and we're just going to accept that we're starting not at zero. We're starting at a phase shift of four seconds into the problem. I'm okay with that. Disgusting. Now its highest point is eight feet above the water level. Cool beans. And that's all the information they give you except for, oh, that's an important clue. It took another 30 seconds before it reached the that maximum height again. Guys, I think they just flat out told you something important. Period. That's the period. You don't even have to think. There it is. Now the period is going to be calculating B for you. So it's 2 pi divided by the period. Yeah, and we're going to leave it in terms of pi. So 5 or 15, we're going to use that clue. Um, here's the other thing we got to remember, though. There's a diameter of the paddle wheel given to you. It's 12 feet. So from high to low point is a distance of 12 feet. So this bottom line here is at a distance of negative 4, like in reference to the water level, which makes sense because it should be underwater. Um, the middle point here, if I added them together and divided by 2, I would get 2. And then I always have to kind of symmetry double check that. My amplitude would be up 6 and down 6. So I'm notorious for messing that calculation up. Also, in doing that, I stumbled upon the amplitude. So we have, um, let's see, they want d equals. We have amplitude of 6 on a cosine function who is not reflected. We accepted that we have a phase shift of right 4 and our b value, oh, b value first, pi over 15. Phase shift, keep it factored out of the b. So I think they want to be used t on this question somewhere. I thought I read that. Maybe not. I have t minus 4 for the start four seconds later. Double close your parentheses here to close the shift and close the cosine function. And then your midline, remember, was a plus two. So this is another case where you could go on your home screen 50 seconds in if you were to plug a 50 in right there for t. Methinks you get a negative 3.9 or something like that. Which made me very paranoid at first, but then I remembered that this was a paddle boat dead fish question. So he's allowed to be negative. But please do try typing that in. Now, if you knew you were good on time and you were approaching this through your graphing mechanism on your calculator, you could evaluate it straight off the graph. That would work fine. What? Uh, yeah, that would work. All right. Then we get to the new stuff. <laughs> well, let's talk. Tangent and cotangent. You're going to get one of them on the test tomorrow. Well, some of you are going to get tangent, some of you are going to get cotangent. My favorite kids will get tangent. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Just for that, I'm going to give you version Q and it's going to have something else. Um, now, guys... Can you just remember that you have a $150 machine in front of you? So if you're like, I can't remember what tangent looks like. You can graph it. I hate when kids like panic on graphing anything. I'm like... <sighs> so if you like legit cannot remember what tangent looks like, graph it. Um, so give me some thoughts here, guys, because there might be a moment in my life where maybe I don't have a graphing calculator and I got to remember this. Tangent... If I think about tangent on the unit circle at zero, zero is zero for tangent. Tangent of zero is zero, sine over cosine. So tangent's the one that goes through the origin. Tangent and cotangent have shorter period lengths. They're only a period of pi. And they only have two pieces to them, right? So instead of quarter points, you would just have these. So that's how we mark. So going half a unit to the left and right... I would be at negative pi over 2 here, this is 0, and this is pi over 2. And they are very specific about tangent and cotangent. I need two periods graphed. So they alternate between intercepts and asymptotes. So this next guy, which will be an intercept, is going to be at pi. And then the next one will be an asymptote at 3 pi over 2. And then I bust out my highlighter. Because I can't draw anything. I lost it. Where'd you go? Oh, I should really use my fun pens someday, huh? I forgot I have those. Um, I have, like, smiley face pens and stuff. 
flowers? Rainbow? Okay, I know these are intercepts, but I still sometimes am fuzzy about shape because we don't have a ton of experience with tangent. This is where you trust your calculator, and your calculator says tangent's shape, uh, unless you have some weird reflections, down on the left and up on the right. So off to the side here, this is what the test would look like. It'll say, like, label your intercepts and your asymptotes over here. This is really just lazy teacher mode. This is easy for me to grade. Sorry. <laughs> um, so intercepts, I'd love to see ordered pairs, guys. Like, this is an intercept that's at 0, 0. And this is an intercept at pi 0. Now the asymptotes, those are lines. Technically, this is the theta axes. So your asymptotes are at theta equals, the ones we graphed, um, negative pi over 2, at pi over 2, and at 3 pi over 2. You can kind of be lazy like me where you just list them all out with commas. But you're gonna on the test because there's going to be blanks just like that. Oh, you, you went backwards? You weirdo. All right, it's fine. <laughs> Because otherwise it's not a line. It's just gibberish. But you understand what you mean when you say asymptote. Could you please write it as a line? Oh, you mean x instead of theta? Yeah. Well, I hate to point out the obvious, but there's no x in that problem. <laughs> All right, so what if you were the unlucky soul who got cotangent? Yeah, what else? There's other things that are different. Now, cotangent remembers the reciprocal tangent. So anytime tangent was 0, cotangent is undefined. So instead of having an intercept at 0, Cotangent has an asymptote at zero. But the markings still work the same way. So it's going to count in halvesies, pi over two halvesies. And it's going to alternate between intercepts and asymptotes. Because you went negative? Gosh, you're weird, Adam. <laughs> Teasing you. Uh, let's see, that's the three pi over two then. And then the next asymptote would be at two pi. Remember, I need two period lengths here. Now, I have to remember cotangent's shape is also different from tangent. And again, you have a calculator, so if you forgot, you could look it up. But you guys remember cotangent does this? Because why not, right? It's the reciprocal tangent, so we shouldn't be seeing the same, same graph. So that's, that's two cycles right there, so I don't have to do any more. But I do need to label some stuff. So I see intercepts at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, 0. And if you're like Adam and you went negatively, you have negative pi over 2, 0. That's the beauty of sinusoidal and cyclical functions like this. Like, there's a definite pattern. So if I go forward in the cycles and Adam goes backwards in the cycles, like, there should be a clear, obvious pattern to me as the grader. Like, Adam, you did great. You just went the wrong direction because you're weird. It's not wrong. I shouldn't say that. All right. And then Daniel, theta equals, first asymptote I drew was at 0, and then we got one at pi, we got one at 2 pi, if you went backwards, you have one at negative pi, whatever. Now the other reciprocal functions that you're responsible for are secant and cosecant. This time I only want one cycle because there's a lot going on. I'm not going to phase shift you on anything in this section. I know the homework had some phase shifting. We're not going to do that to you on this test. But you do have to ghost in his buddy. Who would be the buddy of four secant? or cosine of theta over 3, which is really one-third theta. So I'm going to pretend like that's what I'm graphing, and I'm going to use that graph as my guide for the secant graph. So let's get some obvious stuff in. we got a midline at 0. Oops, that's 0. A maximum at 4 and a minimum at negative 4. I haven't really talked about period on this question yet. So the B value is one-third... So what does that do to the period? Yuck. 6 pi. Well, that's not friendly. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to quarter that. I can because I passed fifth grade. All right. So if I quarter point that, and notice Daniel said quarter point because these are split into quarters. This is the normal stuff. Uh, yeah, 3 over 2. Ooh. We got this. All right. This is what I'm counting by. 3 pi over 2. So when you count, you're counting by 3, 6, 9, and so on and so on. So starting at 0, you're going to have a mark at 3 pi over 2. And then it would be 6 pi over 2. Give me a better name for 6 pi over 2. 
Yeah. And then it'd be 9 pi over 2, which is that. And then it'd be 12 pi over 2, better known as? Woo, that's where we're supposed to end. Yay. All right, now who am I ghosting in? Cosine. So no shift, normal little cosine. Here we go. Yeah. And then we got to remember that this is not even who I want. So now I bust out the highlighters again. Every time I cross the midline, that becomes an asymptote. So you're an asymptote. You're an asymptote. I sound like I'm cursing it. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other things that we can mark up, those maxes and mins, they're still maxes and mins. And now we're ready. So if it bothers you that you have like half of a horseshoe, just do this. Bothers me too. But I only needed one cycle, so you wouldn't be wrong if you just showed me half of the horseshoe. But I still need you to label some stuff for me, okay? So you should label two asymptotes. Uh, what do we have here? Theta equals 3 pi over 2 and 9 pi over 2. That's gross. And then you got a maximum right here at 0, 4. I want the whole ordered pair, please. You got this minimum at 3 pi, negative 4. And then you got another maximum over here at 6 pi, 4. So I have no doubt that you guys can transfer stuff from your graph over to the line. Just make sure that the stuff on the graph is in the right spot. Oh, those are fun. And now for, well, cosecant would be you'd ghost in your sign, right? Um, I'm going to skip that one, though, if you don't mind. Inverse stuff? You want to look at stuff? Remember, you can't use your half sheet on the test. You only get your normal unit circle with the information on the bottom. This is just extra problems. I'll tell you the one I'm most worried about. I'm most worried about this question and this question. I'm going to be honest. I'm pretty much worried about every tangent question ever to be had. Tangent really messes with everyone's mind, including mine. But those two in particular, I think, are... Actually, I take that back. Number two. These are not on your paper anywhere, are they? Yeah. Uh-huh. Zeros mess with you. Because you're like, there's a lot of zeros on the unit circle. And are they asking about, like, that it is zero, that it can be zero? Is the radian measure? Okay. So when these inverse function ones come up, I rewrite them as equations. I say, this is asking me, when is the cosine zero? That puts it in perspective a little better for me. So now I go look at my unit circle. When is cosine zero? So where is, first of all, where is cos arc cosine defined? Here to here. So somewhere in this region, you got to tell me when the cosine is zero. And I think it's this guy. So pi over two. I get a lot of kids who go, the answer to that is one. Because they think it's saying, what is the cosine at zero? It's not what it's saying. And I'm with you, Daniel. Zero stink. Because you really got to stop and think about it. Now, number four. I'm also worried about number four. I was trying to trick you, Adam. Couldn't trick him. He says, the answer is negative pi over three. What was I kind of secretly, like, evil villain in me hoping he'd say? Five pi over three. I was hoping he'd be like, five pi over three, Mrs. Abruzzo. And I'd be like, no, teachable moment. Uh, arc sine is only defined from negative pi over two to pi over two, which Adam already knew. Um, but that angle down there, you can't call it five pi over three, even though on the normal unit circle, that's what it's called. We have to be smarter than that and remember that they measure from negative pi over two to pi over two only. And then... Eight is undefined? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to me because you're telling me an undefined radian measure? That's confusing. This question is saying, when is your tangent zero? Well, for a tangent to be zero, it would have to have a ratio of sine over cosine that works out like this. It's at zero radians. <laughs> Daniel just, <laughs> his brain just exploded. Okay, can I show you guys a little math teacher secret? Can you just make sure your calculator's in radian mode and type inverse tan zero? It's zero. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's zero. Okay. <laughs> the answer is zero. Um, now, now I know what you're saying. You're like, well, I'm just going to type all these in. Now, the spirit of us doing this, guys, is because we need the skill later on. So don't do that unless you're really, really in a jam. Or, like, you have 10 minutes left and you're just going to go through all your questions and check them. Um, 
you know tangents the bane of my existence right so when you get to like these guys i have to every year I, 20 years guys i still struggle with is it pi over six or is it pi over three and i think i've come up with this guy is the pi over six family and this guy is the pi over three family which one it is depends on whether it's positive or negative but i think i, I might have it right this time and then you know what's going to happen next year when i teach pre-calc i'm going to have that same moment where i'm like is it pi over six or is it pi over three so you guys are safe. I got it now for the next two months. It's going to go out of the brain again. Two after months. This. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> so we have another trig packet after this, and then trig comes back again when we have to do, like, bearings and vector problems. That's what it is. No. Free calc is big part of trig. There's a lot of trig in calc. All right, so these are the ones where you got to sketch. Give me a triangle. Watch your signs. That's the biggest issue for you guys. You throw negatives willy-nilly around or forget them. You want to look at... Um, this one's kind of interesting. It says, create me a situation where your tangent ratio is negative 4 over 3. So first of all, where's tangent arctan defined? First and fourth, yeah. So which quadrant do I have to be in if arctan is going to be a ratio of negative 4 over 3? It's got to be in quadrant 4. So create your triangle. Watch your signs, people. We know it's 4 over 3. Which part of that is negative? The 4 is negative because it's a vertical moving down. Now this is a cute Pythagorean theorem problem where it's a 3, 4, 5. They're not all like that. And now they want you to evaluate the sign of this particular triangle, which is clearly a negative 4 over 5. Now, I just gave a sine ratio in the fourth quadrant, and the answer was negative. Does that make sense? Should sine be negative down there? Yes, it should. All right, cool. You need to double check these things. Um, these are extra problems. I, I, well, that one's on there, but this is an extra problem. Can we look at this one? This is in spirit of worksheet 22, the question that Daniel asked about earlier today. So the algebraic ones, they're always in the first quadrant for us. We're just assuming positive variables. And it says your arc cosine is b over 5. So who can I label? Um, Who's this guy? It's b. <laughs> I'm on this question. This made up one. Because it says cosine is b over 5, and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. I know. This is what happens in trig. Like, you do all the hard stuff, and then you're like, what's sine? <laughs> yeah. It happens in calc, too, but like calc also. Okay, so use a little shortcut. I think that's smart. It's the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the leg squared, so that would be the square root of, I heard 25 minus b squared. Love it. Don't try to simplify that. It does not simplify. So now they want to know the sine ratio. So the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the square root of 25 minus b squared over 5. Again, nothing simplifies. The only thing that you might have to do is rationalize, but no simplifying out of that radical. You can't. I know you want, but that's not 25, Daniel. It's 25 minus b squared. Gah. So leave it. Done. The only extra step you guys would take there is if I asked for secant. Or not secant, excuse me. Cosecant. Because then it would have been flipped, and then it would have been like, wah, wah, I got to rationalize. Okay? That's it. So when in doubt, just don't do any extra work. It's right up your alley. You like it. The other one, tangent, yeah, I think you will have to rationalize that one. Oh, wait, let me think. Cosine, oh, no, because it'll be square root over A, because your adjacent leg is A, right? The tangent is opposite over adjacent. So isn't this your, yeah, neither one of these had to rationalize, which makes me hope on your test you don't have to rationalize, but I won't swear to that. What? Here? This? Um, yes, but square root of 112 breaks down. 16, maybe? Try that. Hmm. 
Okay, yeah, so break that down and then you're good. Alright, good luck everybody!